Well, this is um, John Zaborski. Okay, for you. at the um, UW Botany Department. So maybe you could tell more about what you do. But I'm a postdoctoral researcher. I'm sorry, I can't hear. We don't. So speak up. I'm a postdoctoral researcher oh, in the herbarium and. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the Wisconsin State Herbarium, which is in the Botany Department at UW Madison, uh, where I research plants of Wisconsin and I'm leading an effort to write a flora for the state, which is a technical manual for identifying any wild plant, native or non native, that occurs in Wisconsin. And I got my PhD there as well in the department. Mm -hmm. And um, as somebody mentioned, there's a second um, talk in two weeks, like on Thursday, April 6th, in the same room, same time. That would be so a continuation. Yeah. So, yeah. It. so thank you for doing this. Yeah. Appreciate it. So I'm going to talk about just kind of learning the basics of plant identification. Um, and then go over some of the most common plant families that are in Wisconsin. So ones that have the most species and they're some of the biggest families in the world. Um, and then the talk next week or two weeks from now, we'll cover the three largest families that we have, which are asters and goldenrods, grasses, and then sedges. And all of them are very, have a reputation for being difficult to identify. <clears throat> You move the mouse over there one one way or the other and then click and then you should be able to use the keyboard okay so we have four main groups of vascular plants in wisconsin so vascular plants if you think back to grade school have xylem and phloem in them right for transporting sugars and water and they are the lycophytes the ferns conifers and then flowering plants or angiosperms um, so those are the four ones that you will encounter in Wisconsin and the flowering plants are the most uh, diverse. So telling the four apart, if you have an unknown plant, uh, lycophytes are very small plants. Um, they have very simplistic leaves called microphylls that just have a one vein in them. They don't have branched veins like you think of on a you know maple leaf or an oak leaf. And then they reproduce with spores, the little tiny things kind of like seeds. Um, that are held within something called a sporangium, which is held inside of um, like a cone-like structure. So they do kind of look like a little miniature pine tree, some of them, but they are not related to pine trees in any way. So we have three groups in Wisconsin. Um, they're most common up north, but they do uh, find a couple of them down in the Madison area. Um, so the club mosses, the tall ones, the upper right-hand corner are spike mosses, and then quill warts, which are aquatic plants that grow at the bottom of lakes. And then the next group would be ferns. So these are plants that have uh, what's called a megaphyll, so a big leaf that has a lot of veins inside of it. Um, and then the leaves of most ferns um, are divided in some way. So you can see there's a great deal of diversity in the tropics. And we do have some pretty diverse ferns in Wisconsin, probably about 30, 40 species. Um, and a fern leaf is called a frond, and it's usually divided, so it like has a feather look to it. And all of these slides I sent to Teresa, I think she sent them out, so if you miss a term, there's a PDF online, so you don't have to worry about coming back to it. <laughs> um, just there's the camera. Uh, the table. Ferns also reproduce with spores rather than seeds, and these are held in structures called sporangia usually on the underside of a leaf. And when you flip a fern leaf over, you'll see these little dots on there and those are where the spores are held and then they're released up into the wind. What are the spiky things though? Is that the female? Which thing? That to the right, to the right. This? Yeah. yeah. So this is a fertile frond and those little nubs are where the spring is. I see, okay. That's a sensitive yeah. fern. Oh, yeah, so and then the next group are conifers, so gymnosperms, seed plants, uh, evergreens. Um, these would be your pines, hemlock, spruce, junipers that we have in the state, yew as well. Um, they have naked seeds, so they don't produce fruits. They're just held in a cone or in a somewhat fleshy looking thing like the berries on a juniper. 
They're all wind pollinated. All of our species are evergreen except for one. So they have their needles year round. Um, and all of them are woody. And there's evergreen or conifers in Madison area, like the red cedar, but most of the pines and stuff are up north. So the bulk of our plants in Wisconsin and the bulk of this talk are the angiosperms, so flowering plants, those that have flowers, obviously, and also produce fruits and seeds. And they are the most diverse group of plants on the entire planet. So you can see almost 90% of all plants on Earth are flowering plants. They can be herbaceous, meaning they die back to the ground every year, or woody, like trees and shrubs and vines. They can be annuals or perennials, so they either come back every year or they complete their life cycle in one year and die. And they're either terrestrial, growing on the land, or they're aquatic, growing underwater, including the oceans. So if you encounter an unknown plant and you want to know what it is, um, I'll go through the different things that you should look at to determine what you might have. So the first thing to look at would be, is it an herbaceous plant or is it a woody plant? So if it's woody, it's pretty easy to tell, right? It's a shrub or a tree and it's going to have a big trunk and it's going to be hard. Herbaceous plants <clears throat> might have a slightly woody base. So like at the end of the year, a goldenrod or an aster or something like that is kind of hard at the bottom, but it always dies back to the ground and that stem is gone the next year. And the same is true with annuals. So this little thing, you're going to be able to just rip that right out of the ground and it's going to be really tiny most likely. So annuals and perennials, if you do have an herbaceous plant, a perennial, you're going to have a hard time ripping it out, right? Because it's got a big root system that's holding it in the ground. An annual, you're going to be able to rip that right out, right? Shrubs and vines and trees are the three uh, groups of woody plants that we have across a bunch of different families and species. So shrubs are woody plants that have multiple stems coming from the ground. They can get pretty big, right, but they don't become as big as a tree. Vines have woody stems that are supported by other vegetation, or they climb on rocks. So that's a poison ivy vine growing up a cliff. And then some shrubs, like the wintergreen on the right, uh, can be pretty small, but they do have a woody stem. And then, of course, trees are pretty self-explanatory that they're woody. <laughs> So these terms you might remember from school too, dicot or monocot. So if you've got a plant that is herbaceous or woody, um, the next thing to look at would be if it's a dicot or monocot to kind of lead you down the path of what you have. So dicotyledonous plants have two seed leaves when they come up when they sprout, so tomatoes and peppers, and, uh, cucumbers and things like that. They can be herbaceous or woody. They have branched leaf venation. So if you look at a leaf, and you look at the veins, they can out in the uh, center, like a feather. They have their vascular system and rings, so that xylem and phloem in the stem, like when you cut down a tree, you see the rings that it's created over time. All the other herbaceous ones, too, if you cut it and put it under a microscope, you can see the rings on it as well. Or, well, just be one, most likely. And then their flower parts, so the sepals, petals, stamens, and pistils, are all kinds of different numbers, and I'll get into that in a little bit, but they're usually in fives. Monocots are all herbaceous in our area. They're woody in other parts of the world, like palm trees and agaves and things like that. They have parallel leaf venation. So when you look at a leaf on a lily or a grass, you can see it's just a bunch of veins that are running parallel and they're not branching in any way. Their vascular system is in scattered bundles. So rather than producing rings, so if you cut down a palm tree, you'll just see there's all these little circles around it and each of those have xylem and phloem. It doesn't produce true rings like an oak tree would. And then their flower parts for almost every single monica on the planet are in threes. So three sepals, three petals, six stamens, three pistils. Oh. So a multiple of three. Yeah. So next would be to look at the leaves of the plant that you have <laughs> and looking at the leaf arrangement. So there are three types of leaf arrangements, alternate, opposite, and whorled. And what this is referring to is on the stem, you've got spaces in between leaves or branches that are called internodes. And then where the leaf comes out is called a node. And the leaf sits below a bud, 
So when you look at a tree that you have, wherever there's a bud, a leaf is going to come out from there. In an alternately arranged plant, the leaves alternate back and forth on the stem. On an oppositely arranged plant, there's two leaves coming out of the node, one across from the other, and so forth up the stem. A whorled plant um, has three or more leaves at a node. So it's just like an opposite one, but there's at least one extra leaf there. Then you want to look at if it's a simple leaf or a compound leaf. So on these drawings, these are all simple leaves. They're not divided up into any kind of smaller sections. It's just a solid piece of tissue that goes down to that note. Uh, to that note. On a compound leaf, like the ash here, <coughs> you might think that this is a leaf, but these are actually leaflets because they are not associated with a bud. So if you follow them down, you can see that they just attach the petiole here and there's no bud. But once you go farther back, and you can see that there is a bud there telling you that that's a compound leaf. Mm -hmm. So this would be things like ashes, poison ivy, um, black walnut, hickories all have compound leaves. And then on a leaf, the little stem-like structure at the base of it that connects it to the true stem is called a petiole. <coughs> so leaves can either be simple so it's just that one piece of tissue, compound, so like these that are into smaller units, or even twice compound, like in a Kentucky coffee tree and all of these different tropical legumes. In that case, instead of just this smaller leaflet, there's a bunch of really tiny leaflets on one section, almost as if that was one leaflet by itself. And then you kind of just follow those back until you kind of get to the bud. And these different leaflets can be modified in different ways. So you might have stipules, which are an important characteristic for identifying plants, like in the rose family and the legumes. So these are little flanges of leaf tissue right at the base of the petiole where it attaches to the stem. <clears throat> so in addition to a pinnately compound leaf, like these, where it's uh, divided like a feather, you can have a trifoliate leaf, so three leaflets, like poison ivy, or palmately compound, like a buckeye or a horse chestnut, where all the leaflets attach to a single point, like your palm of your hand. <clears throat> then if you have a simple leaf, or even if you have a compound one, um, the margins of the leaf are very important to look at. So in many cases, <laughs> the margins will be entire. And what that means is that they're just smooth. There's no teeth, there's no lobes, nothing on them. Or they can be lobed. So that means that you've got these like um, incisions on the leaf. So like on a maple or even an oak leaf, where it almost looks like someone has cut tissue out of it. So in this case, this is a lobed leaf. And then these margins can be further um, but um, have other features to them, like teeth on the leaves. So in this case, this leaf is lobe, but it's also serrate, which means it has little teeth along the margins. And there's lots and lots of terms. I know I'm probably throwing a lot of terms at you um, to describe all the different diversity in the different parts of leaves. Then there's important features to just the surface of the leaf itself. So it could be pubescent, which means that it has hairs on it. And the hairs can be soft. They can be rough, like sandpaper, like on an elm leaf. Um, the leaf could have waxes covering it. So the back of a silver maple leaf is white because there's a wax that the plant produces, and you can actually rub it off. Or they could be glandular and sticky um, because of hairs that are producing little compounds on them, like a black walnut has. So when you touch it, it makes your hands all smelly. That's because of the glandular hairs. Then the leaves themselves could have an odor, right? So when you break up a leaf of a carrot or a mint, there's an odor to it. And some may also have colored sap, which can be important. So when you break a leaf, um, like of a spurge, so um, like a poinsettia, right? It's got white sap, mulberries have white sap, poppies have colored sap. <clears throat> so here's a look at a hairy leaf, right? 
there's some white hairs and there's um, coppery ones. And then if you can see these little golden things on this leaf, those are glands as well. Then the plants themselves can be armed. And what we mean by that is that they've got something that is sharp on the stems. So there's three different kinds of things that most people just call thorns, but in botanical nomenclature, they have very specific terms. So a thorn, a true thorn is a modified branch. So it's a branch that no longer produces leaves. It's just sharp and there for defense or some other reason. So honey locust, the ones that are planted in yards are a cultivar that doesn't produce thorns because you wouldn't want this in a park or in a yard. Uh, plums, wild plums, buckthorn has true thorns. <laughs> Spines are modified leaves. So like on a cactus, gooseberries on the right, black locust, prickly ash, those are all true spines. Mm -hmm. And then prickles are what is on roses and blackberries. And those are modified epidermis. So the upper layer of the stem just grows out and then becomes pointy. So how can you tell what you have? It's based on where they're located. So a thorn always arises from a bud. It's always gonna be associated with a bud on a plant. Uh, spines are always located near where a leaf comes out, so or a branch, so at a node. And then prickles can be everywhere. They're going to be all over the stem. They're not going to follow any kind of pattern. The other thing that's very important to take into account in trying to figure out what plant you might have is habitat. So there are some plants that are only going to grow on a cliff, right? And you're not going to expect to find a water lily up there. <laughs> there are some that only grow in urban environments, right? So this is a tree of heaven grown outside the frat houses on campus, which is a really invasive tree and they've got signs up on it instead of just cutting it down. Um, but that is, at least in Wisconsin, just an urban weed tree. It's in Milwaukee and it's in Madison and it's always in junky areas. Some plants may require very specific conditions. So that's poison sumac. It only grows in really nice wetlands, deep off in the wetland. Like you have to go looking for it to find it. Some plants require very specific types of soil conditions. So this is seaside goldenrod, which is not native to Wisconsin, but is native to the Eastern seaboard where it grows by the ocean, but it's migrated into the Midwest along heavily salted highways. Huh. So this is just outside of Milwaukee, growing in a ditch along I-43. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then obviously aquatic plants are always associated with water. So there's two different types of water lilies growing in there. And then obviously, you know, pretty spring flowers and rich, wonderful forests as well are not gonna be growing in forests that are disturbed or heavily grazed or where people are cutting stuff down. And then the range of a plant is also very important in many cases. So if you are <clears throat> down here in Oregon and you're trying to figure out what raspberry you have, you're probably not going to have thimbleberry, right? Because it only grows up north. This record is incorrect. If you're in La Crosse, you're not going to find beech trees unless they were planted. If you're pretty much anywhere in the state, you're not gonna find our native buckthorn because it's only down here. In the central part of the state, you'll find this Rexia, which is the only representative of this tropical family that we have here, and you're not gonna find it anywhere else. But then other plants like blue vervain, which is a nice native, and then chickweed, which is junk, um, are all over the place, right? They don't have any kind of specific ecological or any other kind of condition where they can't live everywhere else like these other plants do. <clears throat> so the next most important, maybe the most important thing, is the uh, structure of the flower, right? So if you have a plant that has flowers, that's your, what's you're going to what you are going to be looking at um, to identify it. And I'll try to go through this a little quicker. So the pedicel, number one down here, is the stalk on which that flower sits, right? It's just the stem, sometimes called a peduncle. And then the receptacle is just the next part up onto which all the different parts of the flower attach, right? So if you like strip a strawberry flower, you'll see that there's just like a flat area that everything was attached to. That's the receptacle. 
So looking at the whorls of leaves on the flower, the first whorl are the sepals, which collectively, if you want to talk about all of them at once, is called a calyx. And these are what enclose the flower in bud. So when you have a flower that hasn't opened yet, and you've got that green protective co cover on it, those are the sepals. And then the colorful part that we all enjoy are the petals, right? And then if you want to talk about all of them together, we call it a corolla. If you want to talk about all of those parts together, the sepals and the petals, we call them a perian. And if the sepals and petals, they usually look different from one another. If they don't look different from each other, we call them tepals. And a good example of that is on a magnolia. So if you look at a magnolia flower, hopefully in a couple of weeks, <laughs> um, and start at the bottom, you'll see that there are some tepals that are kind of green, and then they just kind of turn into petals, and they just keep spir they are spirally arranged in a magnolia, and then they just become white like that. So there's not really like a clear area where they stop being one or the other. Then we have the reproductive parts of the flower. So the stamens are the male part. And if we're talking about all of them together, we call them the andresium, which means house of males. And they're made up of a filament, the little stalk, and then the anther, which is the fertile part that creates the pollen. And then the last part is the pistil, the female part of the flower, which is often called carpal in a lot of books. Um, so if you're using like one of the manuals, you might see them used kind of interchangeably. And really the carpal is just the units within the pistil. And so within that pistil, you've got a fat base to it called an ovary, and that contains the ovules, which turn into seeds when it gets pollinated. And then there's a little stalk most times called the style. And then at the top of that is the stigma. So what's the difference between a pistil and a carpal? So if we think about a pistil as a leaf that has just kind of closed up over itself and protects the ovules, if it's just folded up and you only have one opening inside that pistil, then it only has one carpal and it's called monocarpic. So a good example, oh, if you have multiple pistils within one flower rather than just one, we call that apocarpic. And an example of that would be a marsh marigold flower, which produces multiple fruits within one flower. So in most cases, we're used to eating fruits where it's just one big fruit from one flower, but a lot of things produce multiple fruits within one flower, but those fruits aren't edible. So you don't see them. So in this case, there's 10 separate fruits in that flower that came from 10 separate pistils. And then in a lot of cases, what you have is one pistil that's pretty much like a bunch of pistils that fuse together to form one big pistil. And in this case, you have a single pistil, but if you were to cut it open, it's got three openings inside of it. So it's three carpelet is what we would call that. So when you cut a tomato and you can see each of the little sections, mm -hmm. that tomato has, you know, with a big beef steak one, it's like eight carpels inside of it. So the next time you cut a fruit, if you look for either the number of openings in it or the number of places where the seeds attach, you can count the carpel number. So in this case, this is called syncarpic, meaning fused. <clears throat> <clears throat> the position of the ovary within the flower is also important. So an inferior ovary, like in squashes and cucumbers, all of the other flower parts are attached to the top of the ovary, and the ovary sits below them, so it's inferior to them. And then a superior ovary, all those parts attach below the ovary, and so the ovary is superior to those parts. So that's like beans, tomatoes, eggplants, chilies, the vast majority of things. So the numerical plan or morosity of a flower is also really important for identifying um, families. And it's always referring to the perianth, so the sepals and the petals, and then sometimes the stamens as well. So in some cases, these can be spiraled like in magnolias. In most of them, 
of our plants, they're five maris, meaning the parts are in fives. Some of them they're in fours, like mustards, some buckthorns, autumn olive. And then in all the monocots, it's three maris, so they're in, uh, in, uh, in threes. The symmetry of the flower is important. So if you have a flower that is radially symmetrical, so you can cut it in multiple planes and still have it be a mirror image of itself, that's termed actinomorphic. Hmm. And then if it's bilaterally symmetrical and there's only one plane of symmetry, uh, we call that zygomorphic. And that can be very diagnostic for identifying stuff. <clears throat> the different parts in the flower can be fused to themselves or to one another. So in this little chickweed, there are only five petals. They're just cleft very deeply, um, but they're not fused to, or attached to one another. In this monkey flower, there are five petals, but they're all fused together to form like a tube and then that funny face looking thing that a bee opens up. Sometimes, and the biggest family we have that shows this um, are the roses, you will have what's called a hypanthium. So in this case, the sepals, petals, and stamens all fuse together to form a cup. And then that cup is around the ovary. So either it's originous where it forms like a perimeter around it. So think of like a cherry blossom, or it will be, uh, the ovary will be inferior and that hypanthium is fused to it like in an apple blossom. And then in the flowers themselves, <clears throat> we call them imperfect if the flower doesn't have both of the sexes in it. So on this boxwood, there are multiple flowers here. There's a single female flower and then a bunch of male ones. Mm -hmm. And the male ones only have sepals and stamens. And the female one only has sepals and then a pistol inside. So those flowers, we call them imperfect. And then they're also incomplete because they don't have all four worlds. And then in this case, they're monoecious, which means that the plant has both sexes on it, but in separate flowers, rather than like this crocus, where both of the sexes are present. So there's stamens and a pistil in there, <clears throat> um, which we call perfect. And then all four worlds are there. So there's, in this case, tepals, and then stamens and a pistil. So monoecious, again, means that the plant has both female and male flowers, but they're held separately from one another. Dioecious means that you have separate boy and girl trees, like box elder. And then lastly is just the structures on which the flowers are held, which is called an inflorescence. And there's just a huge array of different ways that plants display their flowers, right? So like on this sumac, We've got this big structure called a panicle, where there's a bunch of branches and tons of flowers on there. On this horse mint, you have all the flowers like clustered together. And there's just a bunch of different um, inflorescences, and some of them are specific to different families or different genera. So here's a wordle of all the different plant families that are in Wisconsin. So anything that ends in an A, C, B, A, E is a family of plants. So think of like um, canids, the dog family contains dogs and foxes and wolves and jackals. So the bigger the word, the more species are in it. And you can see the three biggest ones are sedges, asters, and grasses. I'm gonna talk about the slightly smaller ones. So roses, mints, legumes, paints, mustards, those types of ones. And then there's obviously ones that are really, really tiny where we only have like one species there. <laughs> so this probably looks like a lot of text, but that's why I sent Teresa the, the uh, PDF first. <laughs> so the first family that I'll talk about is the Ranunculaceae, the buttercup family. Um, all of our species are herbaceous, so there are no woody plants in this family. There's just one, and it occurs outside of Wisconsin. Some of them are vines, like clematis, which is in this family. Um, it's a really important component of our spring flora. So a lot of early flowering plants are members of this family. They look a lot like roses in some cases, uh, but they lack 
stipules, so those little flanges of tissue at the base of the leaf, and they never have a hypanthus oh, okay. either. Uh, they either have just like a solitary flower held on a stalk or a couple flowers together. <clears throat> the flowers are always almost always bisexual, so both male and female parts in there, although sometimes unisexual. And then um, sometimes they will have sepals that look like petals. So they won't have true petals, they'll just have very showy sepals instead. And then they have very diverse um, fruit types as well. So this kind of funny formula thing that I left up here on the slides, it's called a flower formula, and we have students <laughs> learn them. Um, what it is, is it shows, it's a way to describe a flower that you have. So the CA stands for calyx, so the sepals. The CO stands for corolla, the petals. The A is the andresium or the stamens. And then the G is the gynesium or the pistils. And then the numbers that are in superscript above them describe how many parts or how many of each part that family or that plant has. So in this family, there's usually five to eight uh, sepals. There's sometimes zero petals or a ton of petals. Lots of stamens with the A. And then the gynesium is underlined because it's always superior. So it's sitting above everything. And then sometimes it's just one uh, pistol or sometimes it's a ton of pistol. So despite having what are termed somewhat simplistic flowers, there's actually a lot of diversity in this family. These are all members of the buttercup family that occur in Wisconsin. So the uh, federally threatened monk's hood, which you can see near Devil's Lake, larkspurs, delphiniums, uh, false rue anemone, meadow rues, buttercups. This one might be in your lawn. It's a native, but one. Mm -hmm. there's a prairie buttercup. Baneberry, whose fruits are really poisonous, and then of course columbine, which there's a bunch of different gardening ones. <laughs> so for each family, I'll just go through some of the most common ones you might encounter. So hepatica, this is a really early blooming, nice plant um, with little, what look like sepals, but are actually bracts, which are just little modified leaves. And then it's the sepals that are colorful and there are no true petals. So we've got the sharp-lobed hepatica, with pointy lobes to the leaves, and then the round lobe hepatica, which has round mm -hmm. lobes to the leaves. Pretty easy to tell apart. And then the true anemones, so Canada anemone, um, which you might have growing in a prairie garden, wood anemone, little really short forest species, the thimble weeds, these are prairie species, task flower, which might be blooming in a couple of weeks. It stays warm. So here's some in a prairie um, just south of Oregon. Very, very pretty spring flower. The columbines. So columbine flowers look pretty complicated because they've got this nectar spur for hummingbirds. Um, mm -hmm. But these are the sepals coming down. And then that tube is actually the petal. And here's one where an insect like, chewed them apart to steal the nectar, essentially, mm -hmm. and not actually pollinate the flower. Marsh marigold, nice wetland plant, which only has uh, sepals and they're showy. Often mm -hmm. called cow slip because of it grew in, it grows in ditches. And if cows walk down to ditches to drink, they would slip on the leaves is the like, story behind it. Mm -hmm. The true buttercups. So these have sepals and petals. We have a number of species in Wisconsin. The kidney leaf buttercup, this little one that looks really early. Cursed crowfoot, a snow wetland species. I don't know why it has that common kind of name. Prairie buttercups. They have aquatic buttercups. Mm -hmm. So they've got really finely divided leaves and they grow submerged and you don't know they're there until the flowers come up. Um, next is the rose family. So in this family, we've got herbs, so herbaceous plants shrubs and trees. <clears throat> they have a really simplistic looking <clears throat> flower. It's really easy to recognize this family. Um, it's just recognizing all the different species that's the problem. So they always have five sepals, five petals, a bunch of stamens, They always fused into that hypanthium, that cup. And then the female parts are really, really variable. They always have alternate leaves. 
that are either simple or compound and always with toothed margins, so serrate margins, and they always have stipules present, although they sometimes fall off early on in the development of the leaf. Their flowers are always bisexual, so there's always female and male parts in there. Again, they always have that hypanthium. And then the fruit types that they produce are all across the board as well. So really important economically, so apples, pears, cherries, raspberries, strawberries, peaches, plums, nectarines, almonds, all those are from this family. Hmm. And you can see that basic flower plan, but with a lot of differences in the pistil. So in this case, the hypanthium is fused to it. Here it forms like a little ring around it. In a rose hip, the hypanthium becomes really fleshy, but the little fruits inside stay dry. And then in some cases, like in the spirea, it just produces little dry fruits that just break apart. So this includes um, a lot of nice native plants and some of them have been brought into cultivation. So nine bark is native. You might be familiar with the purple leaf cultivar that a lot of people have grown in their yards. We do have two native spireas. So they're not just those little dwarf mounded things. Um, we've got the meadow sweet, the white flowered one, and we've got one called hard hack that has pink flowers. Potentilla is in this family. Um, the sink foils. There's some weedy ones, and then we've got two native ones. And then strawberries, of course, we've got two native strawberries in the state. Geum, this genus, we've got the nice prairie smoke, prairie flower, and then its ugly cousin, white avens, which is in like every woodlot in the Madison area. Uh -huh. And it has a little, uh, a teens with a little barb that gets stuck in your clothes later and it gets really annoying. <laughs> but it is native, it's kind of nice. Shrubby sink foil, so you might have the European strain of this going in your yard. Uh, it's called, it's marketed as potentilla. Thimbleberry that I talked about earlier is a raspberry that grows up in Door County and then across the Northern part of the state. The other blackberries and raspberries, um, we have a number of species in Wisconsin. They all have, for the most part, prickly stems, right? and then either palmately compound or trifoliate, the three leaflets. And then they all produce the little blackberry or raspberry fruit. So there's two common raspberries. You might have this one growing in your woodlot. This is also really, really common. The black cap raspberry produces black fruit and it has the waxy stem. And then of course, roses. So we've got a couple native species of roses that don't have multiple petals because there's no reason for them to have that. That's a human thing that we bred for. The cherries and plums. So we've got probably like eight species of cherries and plums in the state. Um, in this case, you can see that little hypanthium cross section here with a single pistil of just one carpal that ends up producing that single stone that's inside of a peach or a plum um, or even in an almond. So the wild plum that should be blooming pretty soon. There's some over by Anderson Farm Park along the railroad there. It blooms before the leaves come out on it. It's really pretty. And then pin cherry, choke cherry, black cherry, the large tree that we have. And then the last group within this family are those that have an inferior ovary. And in these fruits, which are called poems, the hypanthium wall expands to form the bulk of the fruit. So when you eat an apple, you're actually eating all the tissue of that hypanthium. And when you get to the core, that's where the ovary was within that flower. And up at the top, sometimes you can find what's left of the sepals and the petals and the stamens. And you can tell that it's an inferior ovary because it has like two belly buttons. So it's got a little dimple where all that stuff attached and it's gonna have a dimple where the stem was attached to it. So this includes things like apples, pears, mountain ash, aronia, the chokeberry, that's like a big health fruit, service berries, quince. So we've got a couple different native service berries. Our prairie crab apple, this is one of our, or the only native apple that we have in the state, it's not very common. Hawthorns, 
which do produce really big horns. They're more common east. You'll see them in the Milwaukee area, not so much in Dane County. And then the next family is the mustard family. <clears throat> These are all herbs with us, annuals and perennials. Another really important component of our spring flora, some of the earliest flowering plants we have are mustards. <clears throat> they all have alternate, simple, or lobed leaves. And often the ones at the base of the plant will be lobed. And then as you go up farther the stem, they become unlobed. They have a very uh, unique flower plan. So it's multiples of four. So four sepals, four petals, six stamens where two are short and four are long. And it's thought that there were originally when the family evolved eight stamens and for some reason they lost two of them. And then a two carpelate ovary, which forms a unique fruit seen here. So it's either called a silique or a silico. And it basically, it looks kind of like a bean in some cases and it breaks apart and then in the middle of it, you've got this little piece of tissue that all the seeds are attached to. And when it's long and sleek, it's called a silique. And then when it's kind of fat and broad, they call it a silica. The flowers are really uniform, as I'll show you in a bit. Like this is a family that's super easy to spot because it's one of the only things that has four petals for the most part. And there's most of our species grow in like junky areas. A lot of them are introduced weeds that came over accidentally. So you can see in this case, they're cleft, but they're still just four. <clears throat> so florally, it's kind of a boring family because they look really similar to one another. And all their flowers are always white, yellow, or pink, some shade of those. And there's garlic mustard. <laughs> so we do have some nice native mustards. There's some prairie and woodland species, uh, like the lyre leaf rockcress. This blooms really early. Uh, this is a Canada rockcress, and that's tower mustard because it's big and tower. And then that little one that's on the left there, when there's a lot of it, it can be really pretty with all those little tiny flowers. It looks kind of like snow. We've got one species that grows on beaches. So if you go to Lake Michigan, you'll find this in Manitowoc. Even on beaches in like urban areas, it still grows there. Really tiny plants in this family. So you can see from the size of the grains of sand, like that little thing is only about this tall. Grabba or Whitlow grass, it's called. Some nice uh, species of woodlands early in the spring. So these are like true spring ephemerals. So they come up in the spring before the trees leaf out. They flower, set fruit, and then they die back to the ground just as they get shaded out. So toothwort, spring cress, and those can also be really, really pretty when there's a lot of them. And then of course, there's a lot of ugly non-native ones <laughs> in urban and other uh, human influenced environments. So shepherd's purse, Growing along the side of a building, uh, tumble mustard on my friend's farm dump, um, penny cress, garlic mustard, of course. Some of our worst exotics are mustards. So there's a huge area of garlic mustard in the hill. Dames mm. Rocket is in this family. Uh, water cress, this is in the ditch that's over by. Um, where Culver's is now, actually. Um, so it's really invasive, just smothers waterways. Another family with a lot of weeds is the pink family. And while a lot of things in this family have pink flowers, it's actually named after like pinking shears because a lot of members of the family have cut petals. Wow. Mm -hmm. like These are all annuals or perennial herbs. They always have opposite leaves. And the nodes, when they come out, are always swollen and fat. They have a distinct inflorescence type where the oldest flowers with the biggest ball on there is in the middle. And then there's always like two that branch out from it. And then there's two that branch out from those and do the same thing. And then their parts are in fives. So they have five sepals that are sometimes fused to one another. And then five petals and then five or 10 stamens. And then within their fruit, which is a dry capsule, all the seeds are attached to a little structure right in the middle. We call that three central placentation. 
almost all the species of this family that you'll encounter are weeds. We do have some native ones, but they're not very common, or you have to go looking in a nice place to find them. So this includes things like chickweeds, sandwort, stuff that's going to flower within the next couple of weeks. Baby's breath, that's jagged chickweed on the other side. This is a baby's breath that's actually like really invasive. It forms like a big tumbleweed. Bouncing bat or soapwort. Uh, this has really tiny little flowers. It's called null. I don't know where that name comes from. Um, bladder campions. And then dianthus, of course, is a bedding plant, but we've got a couple introduced species there. Uh, chickweed, the full one. This is called pearlwort. You can tell it grows in pavement cracks. There's a single flower right there. Really, really tiny. It looks like moss. And then here's two of the native ones. Um, so blunt leaved sandwort, which grows in like nice oak woods and savannas. It's pretty small, like unless it's flowering, you don't even know it's there. And then um, I'm blanking out what the common name of this one is, but the Latin name is Sabulina, sorry. Um, <laughs> this is a dry prairie or rock outcrop species. It has these little tiny mounds of really tightly held leaves, and then these really pretty little white flowers that come up um, usually like mid-May. Uh, another family is the smartweed family, Polygonaceae. These are herbs, often with swollen nodes as well, but unlike the pinks, they always have alternate leaves, so they're going to come out away from one another. And then they have a unique stipule, right, so that piece of tissue at the base of the leaf, called an ochria, which fuses around the stem and forms like a little collar. And then their flowers, are arranged in involucrate fasciculate units, which just means <laughs> that there's a bunch of little bracts surrounding the flowers, and then they're in a little fascicle, so like a bunch of hooks held together. Um, so you can just find them in like little clusters, like you can see here, and there's just little bracts underneath them. And then the little stalk for each flower is often articulated, so it has like a little like nub in the middle of it. And then their flowers are often pink or white, and then they have them either three, and like two groups of tepals, three lower ones and then three upper ones, or they'll just be five together. And they kind of look like sepals and petals, but they're technically not. And then they'll have either three, like a group of three stamens and then another group of three stamens or eight. And then almost always a single pistil with three carpels. <clears throat> So this includes things like rumex, so sheep sorrel and curly dock, the ugly thing that goes along the highways. Um, <clears throat> these are pretty easy to identify. Um, the majority of the species you'll encounter are non-native, unfortunately, but we do have some nicer native ones. Their fruit always has this little swelling in it, which is called a grain, but it's technically not a grain like you get from grasses. So here's a wet prairie species, tall dock. Curly dock is the ugly one that we're probably most familiar with. This is a, a patient's dock, which is much taller and seems to be expanding a lot in this stage, especially moving along highways. This you probably have all, all of you have in your driveway, <laughs> not weed. So just this little tiny sidewalk crack plant. Later in the year, if you find it, go look for it. It has little tiny, tiny white flowers, but they match all the other things in the family. Um, some things called bindweed, so there's a lot of plants that have bindweed in the name, um, but this is a nice native one. Um, see the flowers right there? They have kind of a morning glory looking flower or a leaf to them, but not a showy little flower. Of course, Japanese knotweed is in this family, so the really invasive thing kind of looks like bamboo. <clears throat> um, pepperweed, this grows in a lot of ditches in Oregon. You can see the little pinkish white flowers. And then jump seed, this is a that's a native woodland plant. Some of them, if you have two, they have all these little prickles on their stems, and they're both called tear thumbs because you'll tear your thumb if you run it along them. Mm -hmm. But they use that to actually climb on other vegetation. And then the water smartweed, this can either grow 
on land as a terrestrial plant or in the water as a floating plant. And if you find it near the shore, you'll actually find stems that go out into the lake and then change into that, which is pretty cool. Uh, the next family is the legume family. So this is one that you probably already know because you've eaten them. Um, with us, these are trees, shrubs, vines, or herbs, and they all fix nitrogen from the atmosphere with their roots. They all have alternate leaves that are usually compound, but only simple in the red buds. And they're either trifoliate with three leaflets, pinnately compound, palmately compound, or bipinnately compound. Um, and they almost always have stipules as well. They have a really unique flower, which I'll show you in a second. And then they all produce a legume fruit, which is a monocarpic pistil. So it's just one single pistil with one carpal inside. Um, that then has the seeds attached on the inside like on a bee. This is the second most economically important family of plants in the world after grasses. So soybeans, obviously, peas, lentils, alfalfa, um, lots of things that are used as gums in foods, licorice, rooibos from teas in this family, jicama, indigo, mesquite, a bunch of different things. You mentioned red bud. Is, is... Is there only one kind and is it native? I grew up in Ohio and there's red buds all over the place. Yeah, it's not native to Wisconsin. Yeah, okay. So in a legume flower, so when you look at a pea later this year when it, if you're growing them, <clears throat> they all have five sepals and are infused into a little tube. And then this really unusual looking flower. And there's three different types of petals within it. There's a big banner petal or sometimes called a standard. Two petals that are on the sides called laterals or wings. And then there's two that are fused together at the bottom that are called the keel. And then within that keel, you've got the stamens and the pistil. And the stamens, there's always 10, and nine of them are fused together and then one is not. <laughs> so here's one kind of blown up. So you can see that banner petal. The two petals that were to the side and then the heel as well. And then just the diversity of leaves. So clover, lupine, red bud, um, tick tree foil. So we do have some trees in this family. So Kentucky poppy tree, which doesn't have a legume looking flower. And then honey locust, which also doesn't have a legume looking flower, but they are legumes. Students really hate that there's lots of exceptions to all the rules in botany. So we say that like this family always does this, but there's one that does it. So black locust, which is native to the United States, but not to Wisconsin, is actually pretty invasive. That's me next to a huge one. Wow. I mean, their flowers are really pretty, but. Uh, and then lots of prairie plants. So this family is really important in prairies and savannas because they can withstand uh, fires. And then they also put nitrogen back into the soil after it gets burned off. Um, so this is, uh, this is a state endangered prairie plum, lead plant in this family, false indigos, stragglers, the bone patches, purple prairie clover, white prairie clover, the tick tree foils, which are annoying because their little legume fruits break off and get stuck in your clothes. The bush clovers on the left and then lupine on the right. And then lots of exotic members of this family that are really bad and hard to get rid of. So the sweet clovers, the yellow one and the white one, the true clovers that are in lawns and fields, birds, uh, foot tree foil, which is planted as an ornamental and that's all over the place. Uh, black medic, which is a little long we need. Another nice one, gray one, goat's rue or rabbit pea. Crown fetch, invasive. Mm -hmm. We do have a really cool legume in Wisconsin, uh, facets loco weed, that only occurs in Wisconsin and nowhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's been found on like two lakes in Bayfield County, and then a couple lakes in Washera County and Portage County. And it reacts to the lowering of the level of the water of these lakes. And when the water level goes down, it produces a bunch of habitat and the seeds come up and they flower and then they get flooded out. And then maybe the water level goes down again in five years and they come back. 
The next family is the Ericaceae, the Heath family or Blueberry family. Um, with us, these are all shrubs and then some herbaceous plants um, that are either photosynthetic or mycoheterotrophic, which I'll show you in a bit. Uh, they can have uh, opposite or alternate leaves, but they're always simple. And in almost every one of our species, they're evergreen too. And they're often very tough and leathery or hairy, uh, lots of different um, adaptations to withstanding water loss. They always have bisexual flowers. And then in this case, the sepals are fused and the petals are fused. And then the stamens are fused to the petals to form kind of this little like urn shaped flower like that um, madrone flower. And then they can have either an inferior or a superior ovary. Um, with us, they're really important in bogs and other nutrient poor habitats like oak barrens and pine barrens in the Northwest part of the state. And then especially Northern forests like Rhinelander area where the soil is really sandy and has like very little nutrients in it. So the herbaceous members of the family that we have are things like uh, shin leaves, but they've got a couple little leaves and they produce these little flowers and they're like this tall. Then we've got things like pine drops and um, Indian pipe, which don't produce chlorophyll, so they can't photosynthesize. And what they actually do is parasitize fungi under the ground. And you don't know that the plant is there because it's just existing as like roots and stems underground. And then they just send up a bunch of flowers. And then lots of bog plants, so bog rosemary, bog laurel, leather leaf, cranberries and blueberries. So we've got two species of cranberries in the state and a bunch of different blueberries. Winter green, which has edible fruit and edible leaves that have a winter green flavor and odor to them. Uh, bearberry or kinnikinick, which grows on dunes. And then these are the habitats you'll find them in. So bogs up north and then the barrens as well. But you can find them around here. So like the sandier soils, once you get into like Bear Blue Hills area, there's blueberries and things there. Uh, the second to last family is the mint family. So these are all herbaceous plants. All of them smell, sometimes good, sometimes not. So like <laughs> Creeping Charlie doesn't smell very good, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a mint. Hmm. They all have simple leaves. They're always oppositely arranged. And then the stem, if you cut it in half, is always square. <clears throat> the flowers are held in little verticils often or just solitary within the axils of a leaf. Um, but in most cases, they form like this little tiny like cluster and then a cluster on top of another cluster. And then in most cases, they're bilabiate with two lips, a very zygomorphic or uh, bilaterally symmetrical flower. And then they have it's called a gynobasic style, where if you look at this, it's technically a two carpelate ovary, so just two parts to it. And it looks like someone took the style and just like jammed it into the middle of it to form this like dimple. And then it ends up forming four separate roots. So this includes things like downy wood mint, wild basil, dotted horse mint, wild bergamot, which is a really common prairie plant. Low calamint, which grows up in Door County on the limestone pavements. Uh, obedient plant, which mm -hmm. is native, and then people also grow it in the gardens. Um, lycopus, or whorehounds, they're called. The skull caps, filaria. You can see that a lot of these have that very two lipped flower. The mountain mints, wild germander, another species of skull cap. And then there's a lot of weeds in this family too, and you're most likely to encounter a lot of those. Um, what is a blank on the comedy? Sorry, <laughs> this is Galeopsis hedge nettle. This is hen bit. It's a little tiny mint. Usually grows in landscaping. Creeping Charlie is in this family. So, you know, a lot of these smell really good. That one does not smell that great. Wow. And then these two you're probably most familiar with because they're probably our most common non-native mints after Creeping Charlie, is motherwort and then catnip as well, which does smell nice, but is gross because it's <laughs> a weed. Okay, the last family is a carrot family. 
uh, BPAC. These are also aromatic, just like the mints, um, but they've got that carrot, fennel, cumin smell to them because of different chemical compounds. These all have alternate leaves that sheath the stem. They wrap around it. So if you think about like if you've ever been pulled mm -hmm. while parsing it or something, you can see it kind of like wraps mm -hmm. around. Almost all of them have divided leaves in some way. So they're either ternately divided, so like with into threes, pinnately or palmately compound. And then they produce an inflorescence called an umbel, which is kind of like an umbrella. So a bunch of branches radiate out from a single point and then come up and then hold all the little flowers like that. And then they have a unique little fruit, which splits into two, called schizocarps. So we have a lot of important crops from this family, like carrots, and parsnips, and celery, and herbs. But a bunch of species are super, super poisonous, like kill you within a couple of minutes, poisonous. It also includes some of our biggest herbaceous plants. Uh, so angelica, cow parsnip. This is my undergrad mentor, uh, as, as tall as I am, sitting next to a cow parsnip. So this is a really big plant. Both of those are native. Huh. Hmm. Poison hemlock, which does grow in Wisconsin and is native. Bulblet hemlock, also poisonous. Um, TMF. Albane, because that one is also poisonous. Uh, water parsnip, I don't know if that one's poisonous, but it's native. It grows in like wet prairies and swamps. You can see all of these have that little umbrella looking inflorescence type. Mm -hmm. And then there are some oddballs, right, that don't fit the mold. So Rattlesnake Master is a member of the carrot family. It doesn't have carrot-like leaves or carrot-like flowers, but it is part <laughs> of the family. Sanicle, or black snake root, also doesn't really look like it belongs in this family, but it does. We have four species of that in Wisconsin that grow in forests. And then a lot of weeds in this family, too. So Queen Anne's Lace, wild carrot, wild parsnip. Japanese hedge parsley, also very bad in Madison area. And then the giant parsnip or giant hogweed. Um, this has been found in Sheboygan, one other, maybe Forest County, and like the DNR went and killed it immediately because it's <laughs> extremely invasive and it, like wild parsnip, causes the contact dermatitis. So if you get the sap on your skin and then get exposed to the sun, you get like a really bad rash. Um, and that one is supposedly worse. Than my own I brought a couple of books along and it's the end of the families. Um, if you were interested in, you know, learning plants in the state, this is a really good guide to non-woody plants in Wisconsin, the wildflowers of the Great of Wisconsin and the West uh, Great Lakes region. It's got a lot of good pictures, maps. It doesn't have uh, keys to identifying plants, but it does have uh, descriptions of them. If you want to learn sedges and grasses, those are covered in these two books. Mm -hmm. We don't have a uh, flora for the state, like a technical manual yet for Wisconsin, um, but Michigan does, and there's a really good deal of overlap between Michigan and us. So this book on trees from Michigan is really good. <clears throat> If you want a more technical guide to identifying plants, this is like the go-to for covering Wisconsin. It probably has 85% overlap with us. It's just missing some prairie stuff that doesn't get into Michigan. And then our Western neighbor has a really good book on sedges and rushes, and then a really nice book on trees and shrubs. Um, lots of really great photos, both of those. The floor of the Chicago region, which I didn't bring, it's a technical manual. It's like this thick, but it's it's super thick because they also included a ton of ecological stuff in it. So for like almost every species, they list the bugs that eat it, the bugs that pollinate it, the birds that eat the seed, like just a ton, a ton of information. It covers like the Chicago land area, but it also covers Racine, Kenosha, and Walworth counties. And it's probably got like 99% overlap with Dane County. So if you really wanted hmm. just to see what uses different plants, that would be a good book to, to go for. This is the book that I used when I was a little kid, Learning Plants, and I brought that one with. And this one uses 
the flower plan stuff that I talked about in the book. So if you just like flip through and look at the headings, five regular parts, four regular parts, three regular parts, flowers that are irregular, so not um, with multiple planes of symmetry, ones with flowers that are really weird. Like it, it's really good, I think. And it covers, it covers all of Wisconsin and then the Eastern United States as well. So there are some things missing from it and a lot of stuff we don't have. Um, but if you want to just try to like learn something in a pretty like simple and straightforward way, this is a pretty good book for that. Are there any questions? I know it's a lot of information. <laughs> Did you say the PowerPoint is going to be available somewhere? Yeah. It's on the, the Facebook post. I don't mm -hmm. know if you saw that at all. Where would I find that? If you search for Oregon Nature Alliance. Okay. And then the an event, you know, the event, and then it's in the, the discussion of the event. Okay. My dog must have found that and sent me the invite for this. <laughs> yeah, I took this uh, presentation and turned it into a PDF and took out all of the just like photos of plants and I just left the like information. So if you wanted to like print it ahead of time or something, I'll do that with the next one too. Because the next one will have a lot of technical stuff with the grasses and things. Yeah. When I was younger, I spent several summers at a scout camp in Oxford, Wisconsin. And across the road was a tamarack forest. And there were pitcher plants in there. Yeah. Are those native to Wisconsin? Yeah. Yep. We have a, quite a few carnivorous plants. We've got a pitcher plant, four sundews, which have little sticky hairs on the leaves to catch insects, um, seven or eight bladder warts, which are totally aquatic, and they have little traps underwater that are pressurized. And so, like, if a little tiny insect hits them, they open and suck the insect <laughs> in and <then> close. <laughs> and then we saw some of those in um, in the marsh at Lerner Park. Oh. A couple summers ago. Okay. And then we have uh, butterwort, which only grows on the Apostle Islands. And that has just kind of sticky leaves as well, but not as um, odd looking as the sundews. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, thank um, you, John. That was great. Yeah.